Would you now please welcome to the stage the Chief Executive of Funsmith, Terry Smith. Ah, good afternoon. My uh, mission this afternoon is to interest you uh, in the problems of pension fund management and I'm going to endeavour to do this after lunch. Uh, I did think of asking the media team to, uh, to play the theme to Mission Impossible as I came on. Uh, to, uh, anyway, I may or may not be able to interest you um, in this subject, but what I'm fairly sure about is you should be interested in it. There are a couple of reasons for that. One is it touches most or even possibly all of you. Um, I would guess that most of you are directors of companies that have got pension funds, maybe even trustees of pension funds, or members of pension funds, or if not, you should be members of pension funds. And uh, so it does really touch most of you. The other thing is it's a very big problem. Uh, the figures on that screen are from the pensions regulator, not from me, and as you can see, the pensions regulator last year estimated that three quarters of all company schemes are in deficit, and that deficit is a very large one. Uh, the aggregate deficit on the basis of, uh, of buying out the liabilities by an insurance company is 675 billion pounds, which I think all of us would recognise as a very large number. It's about the size of the UK government's annual spending. And so we have a very big problem, and one that I think touches most of the people that I'm speaking to and, and me. And I just wanted to take you through what uh, we had done with one of the pension funds that's in the 26% on there to try and reverse that problem and, uh, and to give you some suggestions on things you should and shouldn't do if you want to emulate what we did. Because the one thing I know about this, other than the fact that it's a big problem and it touches most or all of us, is that the solution for the problem can only come from one of three places, from money from the companies, from monies from the assets of the schemes, or by the pensioners getting less than they're expecting. And I have to say, out of the three of those, getting more money out of the assets of the scheme strikes me as infinitely the, uh, the most preferable route to go. In 2003, I took control of a company called Tullet Prebon. And on the slide, you'll see some figures for its pension fund. When we took control of the company in 2003, it had total assets of 60 million in the fund, total liabilities of 90 million and a deficit of 30 million. That doesn't sound like big numbers in, in aggregate, but I assure you if you ask a pensions uh, expert, you'll find that uh, a 30 million deficit on just uh, 90 million of liabilities is a fairly shocking state of affairs. And you can see by the middle of 2013, which the latest figures are available, uh, we had 228 million of assets, 160 million of liabilities and a 68 million surplus. We'd moved into a significant surplus. And we achieved that without putting in any significant additional sums from the company. We did it through the performance of the assets. You can see here I've given you a slide which shows you how the assets performed during that period from the date we took over in December 2003 to the end of 2012. Uh, and you can see here that if you look at the equity markets, the Morgan Stanley World Index is up about 6% compound during this period in sterling. The FTSE 100, about 7% per annum. UK government bonds, about 8% per annum. It's been a very good period to invest in bonds. Uh, we were up 14% per annum before fees and about 13% per annum after fees, compound, every year during this period. Um, and that really means that we outperformed very significantly, and that's how we turned this scheme around. Now, if you look to the right on the slide, you'll see two things which give you a clue as to how we did it, which I'm going to describe briefly. There are 20 holdings in the fund, just 20 company shares in the fund. That's a very low number compared to what most people hold, and we've never held more than 20. And below that, you'll see the annual turnover is 3.5%. Now, if you're quick at arithmetic, you'll quickly work out that 20 into 100 gives you five. That means if we'd changed just one company per annum in the period, we would have turned over 5%. We'd changed less than one investment per annum. Our investment style bordered on the glacial in terms of, uh, of the things that we did compared to our other investors act. So what did we do? We invested only in equities. There are no properties, there are no bonds, there are no derivatives, there are no alternatives. We were long only. All we do is own shares in companies. We don't short them, we don't trade them, we don't arbitrage them, and we buy and hold. We just bought shares in companies with the intention of holding on to them, if possible indefinitely, and letting the returns from those companies get to our pensioners with the minimum of interference by us. It's a very old-fashioned strategy, I think, in the, uh, in the sense of, uh, of a very positive uh, description of old-fashioned. 
Stage two of our strategy, you might say, well, what sort of companies did you buy shares in? We only bought shares in good companies. Now, for any of you who are not in the financial services industry, I'm, I usually pause at this point and make a brief explanation and apology. You may be under the misapprehension that all fund managers buy shares in good companies. Well, I can tell you from uh, decades of working in the broking industries, they will in fact buy any old rubbish, as <laughs> some of you may have encountered in your own investments. They'll buy shares in bad companies because they're going to turn around, they're going to get better, the management's going to change, there's going to be a takeover. Someone bought them lunch and told them a, a story. Um, and some of them are quite good at that particular game, although not many. Um, the trouble is, every day that you own those bad companies, they destroy a little bit of intrinsic worth by their operations for you. If you own good companies, you may or may not get your purchase absolutely right. You rarely get it spot on in terms of share price, in my experience. But you do know that every day that you own them, they become a little more valuable by what they do. Secondly, we tried not to overpay. Uh, why did we try not to overpay? It's not just because we have uh, uh, religious objections, as it were, to overpaying, although we do have those. Um, it's also because we're not trying to buy shares and then on sell them to somebody else. We can't knowingly overpay for one of our investments, hoping that somebody will be an even greater fool and buy it off us for an even higher valuation. We know that the greatest fool in the room is almost certainly us. And lastly, we did the most difficult part of the strategy. Having found some good companies and tried not to overpay for them, we did nothing. That's the very low turnover. In fact, our watch phrase was the opposite of that common phrase. Don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> so what do I suggest that you do and that you don't do if by any chance you want to emulate this strategy? Firstly, you have to do something different. It's no good following the conventional investment strategies that the vast majority of the industry are following. Uh, you will not have a successful investment in your pension fund unless you break out from the herd. You've seen from the condition of the UK pension fund industry what's been achieved by the conventional methodology so far. You must do something different if you wish to succeed. Secondly, only invest in assets which you expect will generate a higher return than your liabilities. It's a council of despair to be told that what you should do is invest in bonds because the rate of return on the bonds will roughly match the rate of growth in your liabilities, the pensions you will have to pay, because the pensions will grow roughly in line with inflation and the bond yield is somewhat close to inflation. Therefore, the two will, will evolve together. So your assets and the liabilities will rise together. Well, if you've got a deficit, uh, which as you can see, three quarters of the pension funds have, all that ensures is that you've locked in the deficit permanently. It's a council of despair. You should seek out investments, and you can find them, if you're disciplined enough, that return more than the compounding of your liabilities. As I said before, only invest in good companies. I haven't got time this afternoon to tell you exactly what my definition of a good company is, but I do have one. If you're seeking out a manager and asking them what is a good company, you'll find quite often that there is no such definition that they've got in their mind. They're going for a lot of verbal arm waving uh, and tell you about uh, good managers and so on. In my experience, the thing to look for is good companies rather than good managers. Uh, I actually believe in the adage that you should only invest in a company that will be run by an idiot, that could be run by an idiot, for a very simple reason. Sooner or later, they all are. <laughs> And, and the key for you as an investor is to survive that moment when they are. <laughs> uh, and last, but by no means least on the do's, minimise costs. Um, you need to cut down the cost of investment. Now, some, some investors do focus on this and spend uh, a lot of time and effort cutting down the, uh, the management charges that are paid to fund managers, and that's not a bad thing to do. Um, but what you need to look at are the total costs of investment. Not only what you pay the investment manager, but what do you pay in consultancy fees. And one other thing which is often o overlooked, uh, and that's the transaction costs that the manager engages in. If you look at the statistics from the UK regulator, the average mutual fund manager in the UK turns over his or her portfolio 80% per annum, which I think is an awful lot. Uh, they must come in and think that they've got better ideas for their portfolio every year for four-fifths of it. I don't have one good idea from one year to the next, frankly, as you can see from the activity that we, we don't engage in. More importantly, when they do so, they probably add about another one to one and a half percent to the cost of your fund, which are not shown in those statistics that you look at for management charges. And yet they are a subtraction from the returns which your companies are generating. The only thing that can pay your pensions are the returns the share price appreciation and the dividends generated by the companies in your fund. 
that cost of dealing is a detraction from that. You have to look at the entire cost of investment and endeavor to minimize that. So those are a few things that I think you should do. What shouldn't you do? You'll probably find the first one a little bit shocking, but not as shocking as you'll find the last one that I'm going to say. <laughs> I'd be wary of taking so-called uh, expert advice in this area, the investment consultants who, uh, who tell you what to do. Um, there are many areas of life where I think the benefit of uh, expert advice is, in fact, an oxymoron. And when I hear people telling me that they're running their pension fund uh, using expert advisors who are very well qualified, uh, what springs to mind for me, at least in the most recent years, is that wonderful uh, episode in the King's Speech where he's telling his uh, uh, speech therapist about uh, why he smokes. One of the great problems with expert advice as well is, once it's taken, it's difficult to ignore. If you're a trustee of a pension fund, Having taken the expert advice to fail conventionally along with your peers, which is what you'll mostly be told, it's very difficult for you as a lay person, as a, a trustee of a fund, to go against that advice. So the best thing is, like many things, if you don't want to, uh, to follow it, I wouldn't take it. Rather like that. Don't invest in anything you don't understand. Let's be honest, for most of us, that's the vast majority of things. <laughs> you might understand something about companies, given you at the IOD conference, I hope you do. Um, you probably understand something about bonds, which are issued by companies and governments. Um, do you really know what a hedge fund does in general, in particular? Do you know what uh, event-driven hedge funds are, what global macro funds are, how arbitrage works? I don't. <laughs> and I'm supposed to be a professional at this. If you don't understand it, <laughs> don't invest in it. If you re when I say if you don't understand it, if you can't explain it to your mum, don't invest in it. Don't pay performance fees. You'll be told that you've got to pay performance fees for uh, certain managers of money because they're very good. And, uh, and the other thing you'll be told is it aligns your interests with theirs. No, it doesn't. It's rather like saying, if you were to have a whip round here this afternoon and equip me with enough money to go and play blackjack on the way home, uh, and I shared the winnings with you, that our interests would be aligned. No, they wouldn't. It's your money I would be losing, not mine. They get the, uh, the performance fee when they do well, they lose your money when they do badly. That's not alignment of interest. <laughs> Try not to deal at all. This comes back to my activity point. Uh, hyperactivity is the enemy of a good performance. It's not the friend of a good performance. Try not to deal, preferably at all, if you can. And last and somewhat controversially, I accept, do not engage in so-called socially responsible investment. And, uh, uh, I would suggest that as a fiduciary, as a, as a manager, as a trustee, uh, looking after investments, your duty is actually to maximize the returns for your investors. It is not to make moral judgments. In any event, whose moral judgments are you going to make? Mine, yours, some third parties. Um, I've encountered investors whose uh, likes and dislikes are very disparate. Uh, I can assure you if you accept investors from, the, uh, from a Muslim background, they'll be far less keen on alcoholic drinks than they will be on tobacco, for example. Uh, so where do you begin with this? Um, even if you don't accept the moral argument that I'm putting forward, um, look at the practical argument. There's a company called Best Invest in the UK, which does an annual report called Spot the Dog, which looks at the worst funds in the UK. I commend it to you uh, if you haven't seen it. Um, and uh, if you look at the 17 worst performing funds in the sector that my fund falls into, which is the global growth sector, the 17 worst performing funds, five of them are ethical or environmental funds. I'm afraid it's a very bad idea in investment to basically ignore any investment in all the things that people like most and enjoy consuming, in my experience. So I wouldn't do that if I were you, not if you want to make a success of your investments. What I think's happened here is, uh, is quite simple. Um, I think over the years uh, that people who run pension funds or responsible pension funds or invest their own money even in pension funds have become convinced by the industry that the process that they engage in is more important than the outcome. That ticking the boxes to say that you've obtained expert advice, that your process isn't different from your peers, that you're socially responsible is more important than the outcome. No, it isn't. The outcome is very important here. If you don't believe that, if you actually think that the process is more important than the outcome, I would suggest to you that the only way you could explain our performance with the Tullet Prebond Pension Fund is if you believe that the following phrase is true. It might work in practice, but it will never work in theory. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Terry Smith, Chief Executive of Fundsmith. <laughs>